What's going on guys, Big VP back with another video in regards to the Game Case Arcades and well, I think we gotta get a couple of things understood about arcades. So the main reason I'm making this video is really for a customer that's about to purchase one of these. I'm gonna send this out to you just so you understand what exactly you're gonna get and how it works and all that. I've sold many of these, but recently I've sold a lot within like maybe a two month span. Um, and I got a couple of customers that come in that they love it, but they didn't realize how sophisticated the system was. So really we're gonna go through an in-depth kind of analysis on how the system is and how it works. It's not just my arcade, it's really anything related to a computer-based Raspberry Pi based system. Um, in all honesty, you do need to learn a little bit. It does take you know a couple of steps and a couple of trial things to learn how the system works exactly. It's not really just like a press and go. There's a lot of things mentally that you have to think about before you could even pick a game. Not many customers really understand that. Again, I'm not trying to say it as if this is impossible and you need to be a brain surgeon to understand this, but there's just a couple of things that is kind of common sense uh, to understand when it comes to these systems. Now again, this video is gonna be kind of wompy and kind of loopy, but I'm making this video to kind of explain to customers new customers, people that want to buy it, people that did buy it, and you know, I'm gonna kind of separate this into a couple of different sections. First thing, going into the system itself, understanding that it's a computer-based system, if you're buying the Raspberry Pi version or the Hyperspin version, you know, this is a computer-based system, so first we're gonna learn about the system. Then we're gonna look into like the actual controllers, and then finally the most common question I get is like the resolutions that many people don't really like when they see, so. Um, you know, there's gonna be a lot of steps, there's gonna be a lot of jumping to this video, but it's something that we just have to understand. Before you buy this arcade, you have to understand these things. It's not just my arcade, it's any arcade, and it's kind of common sense on, you know, a gamer's perspective, but most of the time customers don't really get or understand the common sense to it, but again, I'm making these videos to help people understand. I'm not here to make your life difficult. I want it to be easy and enjoyable, but people do have to remember that it does take some getting used to and some learning. It's basically like you trying to learn the Mac. You know, you want to you buy a MacBook, you got to learn the Mac interface, you're so used to Windows. That's just how it is, you have to learn it. That's the only way to really explain these things. So again, we're gonna start off real quick on this system. We're gonna understand how the HyperPi setup on this specific video is gonna be HyperPi setup. We're gonna understand exactly what a HyperPi setup is and what does it mean and how does it work. Basically, I'll give you an example of what a customer might say when he walks up to this thing and all that. So we just had a customer that said, hey Vic, I wanna play Pac-Man. So, you know, you can't just go and press one button for Pac-Man, you have to go into the menus to get into Pac-Man. What does that mean exactly? For number one, Pac-Man is an arcade game. It's an arcade-based system. There is Super Nintendo versions and there are, you know, PlayStation 2 versions, but most of the customers wanna play the regular arcade classic Pac-Man. So what does that mean? Basically, you have to go into the wheel as you can see right now, we're on NES. You have to go to the wheel of the arcade, and then once you enter into that wheel, then you're able to look for Pac-Man. So the one big thing that people don't really understand is that you have to go into a menu to find a specific game. If you wanted to play Super Mario World 2, that's an NES game. So you're not gonna find Super Mario inside the arcade menu. The best thing to real quick understand is that there are basically two different menus. You have your main menu, which I consider the console menu or the system menu. This menu showed you all your consoles, arcades, Super Nintendo, the Sega Genesis, the NES, the PlayStation, the Game Boy, the Game Boy Advance. Again, I'm naming consoles. Now, the next menu is the game wheel. So basically, once you pick your console, you're gonna get the whole list of the games. So not many people off the bat, they get very confused and they think it's rocket science. It's not difficult, but you have to remember that you have to go into the console to play the game. Gonna lower that. So that's number one. I mean, again, it's not really somewhere like, it's not a Pandora's box where you kind of walk up to it and then the whole you know game list is there. It kind of is like that, but Pandora's box is just gonna show you the arcade game. So yes, you could walk up to a Pandora's box and you'll be able to find Pac-Man, you'll be able to find Galaga by searching the menu, that first screen menu. Uh, but remember, Pandora's box can't play Super Nintendo, it can't play NES, it can't do Sega Genesis, it's only gonna play 1200 arcade games. So that's really off the bat number one. Yes, it is kind of a learning curve, um, you know, just trying to teach you and show you how to pick the game alone takes about 10 minutes. 
Then the other learning curve is to try to figure out the button configurations and the button setups. Um, previously in the past, I've had these set up where I could do a one button exit. But again, from what my customers tell me is that sometimes their you know, pants or their buckle hits the exit button and then the game exits and then you lose all momentum on the game you're playing. So the way I have these set up is that you do have a hotkey, which is the green button. Hotkey is like a shift. So for you to exit, you have to do hotkey exit. It's a two button press, not just one, it's two buttons. You have to hold down the green and then press the red to exit the game. Same thing with the load and the save. You have to hold down the green button and then press load to load a game. Hold down the green button and press save to save a game. So that's off the bat and what many people get confused about. Again, if we, let's just say, we'll load up a game real quick. I'm gonna go into Sega, I wanna play, I don't know, let's play a Sonic. So I'm gonna go to S, Elemental P, Sonic. Sonic the Hedgehog, I'm gonna press the button, and there you go. So the way I have my buttons configured up is that you can press the player one, the first button, which is number one, or the green button to start a game. Once you start it, there you go, you're in it. After you play a little bit, let's say you're bored and you wanna do another game, you have to do hotkey exit. It's a button combination. You must hold down the hotkey, you must hold down the shift, and then exit. I can configure your system to be a one button exit if you want, but again, keep in mind that when you are doing some intense gaming, sometimes you do hit the exit button with your stomach, so you let me know if you want that. Again, we're gonna start by learning first off the HyperPi system and how it works and what it is, and not many people understand what it means, but basically in all honesty, this setup, a HyperPi based system, is a computer. There is a computer inside of these things, so, you know, it doesn't mean that you have to grab a keyboard and a mouse, it's just that it is a computer based system, so there is a computer that loads up, it loads up your front end, which is known as HyperPi, and then it kind of gives you the whole RT kind of look to it. Um, again, when you're doing a HyperPi based system, you know, it's not really just a one, two, three kind of button setup where, you know, one is to exit, one is, it's not really set up like that. There is some getting used to, there is some learning to it, and it's just something that people have to get used to. The reason I make it is because when customers come into the shop and they see it, and then all of a sudden I start into going to how it works, people are like, whoa, like I didn't realize it was gonna be this kind of like, you know, steps. I didn't think I was gonna have to learn it, but in all honesty, you have to learn it. It's something that, you know, it's not, not learn it meaning that it's gonna take forever to learn. It's just, it takes a couple of button presses to figure everything out. The big thing that many people don't understand is that, just like the customer I had an example of, he said, Vic, I wanna play uh, Street Fighter II from when I was in the arcades. You have to go into the arcade wheel and find Street Fighter. You're not gonna find Street Fighter in the Sega Master Systems. Like, you're not gonna find that one. You have to go into the wheel and look up the arcade wheel, and then from there you'll be able to play it. So that's like the first big thing that people don't really understand. Um, I had a customer come to me and was like, oh, I wanna play, um, I don't know, uh, Super Mario Odyssey on the Switch. I'm like, that won't, this won't play that. You can't do that. Not yet, but this won't play that. I'm trying to think of retro style games, old school games, Atari, things that like when you used to have to go to channel three on your TV to play, that kind of games. Um, again, off the bat, first thing is that you have to remember that whatever game you're looking for, you have to think about what system was it on. So, you know, think of that before anything. You know, if you wanted to play Mario Kart, Mario Kart was on the Super Nintendo, so you have to go into the Super Nintendo wheel to play Mario Kart. Again, not expecting you guys to remember all this or remember every, you know, people say, hey Vic, I don't remember what system it was, but you're not gonna find Mario Kart underneath the arcade wheel. Uh, people go to the arcade wheel and they're like, Vic, I don't see Super Mario Kart. I'm like, you have to go into Super Nintendo. And then they go, okay, got it. So off the bat, understand that. You have to understand your consoles. You have to remember back then when and what console was in to play that game. So off the bat, that's number one. As far as computer based and all that, that's how it works. Um, these are set up where you just kind of plug them in and it boots by itself. You shouldn't have to do anything. If you can't get past the boot screen, that means that there's something wrong with the, either the computer inside or the SD card inside of it. So that's something where you really can't do that. You would have to call us to fix it. But you know, that's really, as far as the computer side of it, that's how this works. The next thing I wanna to touch up on real quick are the cabinets, the bar top cabinets. Okay, we're specifically talking about this because I have a customer that came up to me and was like, oh Vic, I want you to add you know, my name to the top or hey Vic, I see like a scratch on the side of it and I'm gonna take you closer to show you what exactly you saw, which is true, I'm not gonna hide it. But sometimes when you get the cabinets in the mail, they come a little dinged up. Not dinged up in a bad way, but like, you know, you do have a couple of like, again, keep in mind it's MDF board. 
so the edges once you kind of tap the edge it will kind of come off but the first thing you know some people say oh wow it's a very plain side cabinet and there's no art to it like why isn't there art to it because that costs money you want the artwork you got to pay extra for it i buy the regular cabinet it cost me 180 bucks just for the cabinet you want artwork with the sides and the marquees and the control panel and the baseboard here that's gonna run you like another 180 bucks. I don't make money off of that. That goes right to Ryan Game Room Solutions. He installs it. I'll make the artwork for you, but for me to buy the vinyl, you have to pay extra for that. So off the bat, I don't make any custom arcades, meaning I don't make them pre-made. If you want a custom arcade, you have to message me and then we, I'll make it you know, according to what you want. Uh, we're coming up right now, there's one coming Monday for a Street Fighter. We made a Street Fighter 2 control panel. That was somebody that requested it. I'll do a custom panel like that, but in all honesty, I sell these bare. Some people like to put their own stickers to it, which is fine, but this is the cabinet. There's nothing else really to say about it. It's a cabinet from Game Room Solutions. The control panel opens, the back door opens. That's the cabinet. The LEDs that you see on the bottom, those are all added by me, so that's something that I do, um, but that's the cabinet. Uh, again, width-wise, looking at 22 inches, almost 23 inches. The TV inside should be a 22 inch TV, but this one I put a 19 inch TV in it. So, you know, I didn't spend the extra money on the, uh, the volume controller and the volume amplifier, which is what a customer wanted. He wanted more bass out of the system. That you need a volume controller for, you need the amp. So I don't do that with this. I mean, this right here, again, this cabinet alone that you're looking at right now is $800. The stuff alone, the components alone, we did it before. It cost me about six six fifty. Just the components that you see here is six fifty. You want to talk about adding an amp and the two speakers? That's going to be another like forty bucks. You want to talk about adding, you know, the bigger monitor? That's another fifty bucks added to it. So that stuff you got to take in consideration. The vinyl artwork alone, again, is one hundred eighty bucks installed. So you're going from a six hundred and fifty dollar it cost me, and in the vinyl to it, you're already at eight hundred bucks. So the big thing I got in this business is that people contact me and they go, can you do better on the price? No, I can't. If you think you could do better, then you do it yourself. I hate to sound that way, but that's how I am. If you think you could do it better for cheaper, do it yourself. Don't even contact me. And then people think I'm a little cocky or mean like that. But in all honesty, you know, for me to make a hundred bucks off of this cabinet, I mean, it's not really profit, but I'm making a hundred bucks. It takes me a week to make. So, you know, there's only so much I could do, but Somebody messaged me and wanted to give me 400 bucks for this. That's a joke. That doesn't work that way. The only last quick note about the cabinet real quick is that, yes, I do add a paper. This is literally paper. An eight and a half by 14 piece of paper as the marquee artwork and the bezel is all paper. If you want a professional vinyl bezel or marquee, again, that's something where you have to pay extra for as far as vinyl. So this comes right out. Of, I'm going to sell this to you. The person that's buying this, is getting it just the way it is. It's a paper, it's paper, it's literally a piece of paper, and the vine, the bezel is paper. So the bezel doesn't look that glamorous, I'll be honest, I'm not a fan of the bezel. Again, I think bezel artwork alone costs about like 30 bucks. The only thing, about, the only thing that I'm against about bezel artwork is that you don't know what the size of the TV is. TVs change every six months, there's different TVs out. So, you know, you could get a bezel with like, let's say a 22 inch gap in the middle, but if your TV's 23 inches, now you gotta cut the bezel. So that's why I don't do bezels. Again, this cabinet specifically is the 22 inch deluxe cabinet. I personally will not be buying this cabinet ever again because I always use TVs and the biggest TV I could get is a 19 inch TV. Previously, I've had TVs. Well, now we only got one RK left because we just had a customer come pick up the white one. Uh, which is perfect. That's going out to an, a guy named Antonio on Instagram. Uh, really cool guy, really cool friend of mine. And now uh, he's actually giving the white one to a coworker and we're gonna make him a custom one. But now we got the one arcade left now next to us. But again, going back to the cabinet and all that. Again, the cabinet is pre-made from Game Room Solutions. I don't make these handmade. I'm not that great with wood and I can't woodwork. Um, so the cabinet comes right from them. So far with Game Room Solutions, I've gotten the control panel which was in pretty great condition because of the vinyl wrap on top of it. So you didn't see any of the little nicks. I'm gonna take you closer and show you a couple of the nicks that usually happens. Um, you know, it's not, sometimes it's happening during shipping, sometimes it happens when, you know, you lift up the control panel, it kind of catches an edge. That again is an MDF board, it's made out of MDF, that's how it is. 
the paint on it, it's MDF board. So in all honesty, to hide the blemishes like that, you need to get the vinyl wrap. If you're very picky, which some people are, you I suggest you do get the wrap. If you're not like me, I don't really care. You notice it, it kind of shows that you know you're kind of actually using the arcade and it's actually really being in use. So so as you can see, like for example, on this arcade that we're gonna show you, you could see on the corners, you do see the MDF uh, kind of just you know kind of chipped away. Take a look at the bezel. The bezel is being held by double-edged tape. Um, the black, you don't really see it too much unless you see it from the sun, the light glare. Um, again, there's one little nick here. Uh, but again, that's somewhere like, you know, it's MDF board. Uh, T moldings, we hammer in the T moldings. We make it look good on a rubber mallet. Take a look at marquee. Again, that's actually two pieces of paper, you know, cut to make it look like one solid marquee. But for you to get the real professional looking one, you do need, you know, vinyl to it. Even on the control panel, you can see we cut out a piece of paper that says the Game Case Arcade logo and all that. Again, that's the cabinet, you know, to keep stuff on the low end, meaning cost-wise, there is no vinyl added to it. If, if you do want vinyl, we'll make a whole custom artwork setup and all that, which we're gonna do for a customer named Antonio. Um, you know, that's really you personalizing it and making it look good. So again, for what you're paying for, it's nothing crazy. You know, it's basically what it cost me to buy, to build. So keep that in mind, especially with the cabinet. Next up, let's talk about the controls, okay? Usually I use the Zippy controllers. This one specifically is using the LED um, joystick on it. In all honesty, Zippy, Sanwa, whatever you wanna do, to me, it's all the same. I've played with all three of them. Yeah, the Sanwa is a little bit, you know, on the you know tougher side of it, but in all honesty, to me, it doesn't matter. The big thing that people need to understand is that joysticks are set up in two different ways. There's a four-way joystick and an eight-way joystick. What does that mean? Four-way joysticks are what usually like Pac-Man had. Pac-Man was four ways, up, down, left, right, four ways. So when you're playing a Pac-Man game on a regular four-way joystick, the controller is perfect. So you could hit that corner and it won't go. It's perfect for a four-way, especially for a game like Pac-Man. These controllers are eight ways. Eight ways, basically, if you think about like clocks, um, you know, it's gonna go from 12 to 130 to three to 430 to six. Basically it's, you know, four way and then it's slanted sideways. So eight ways. So games such as Street Fighter, when you go in, you know, to the top right, you're gonna be able to jump forward and flip. That's an eight way joystick. So the big thing I get and the big thing that people automatically notice and they get really upset is that when you do load Pac-Man on the arcade, Many people can't stand Pac-Man on this arcade. That is because the joystick is set up to an eight-way setup. Um, I'm gonna load up real quick Pac-Man. Again, the main reason I show this one is because people think that it's something wrong with the joystick. People think it's broken. But so many people, remember, if you remember when you played Pac-Man in the arcades, like you would be able to really fiercely go up, down, left, right. You know, it would really hit. Whereas with this, an eight-way joystick, I'm gonna show you real quick, I'm gonna bring you in a little bit closer, but you know, sometimes people, they kinda, of, me me personally, I could do it, I'm okay. Usually I know to like let it go up, down, you know, but sometimes when you wanna actually hit it, sometimes the button doesn't connect. Again, that's because the joystick is set to eight way. There's really a plate underneath this, and you could actually, if you wanted to, and I'll make a tutorial on it, you could actually flip the plate. It's a quick kind of clip on plate. Um, it could then make your Pac-Man experience much better. Really for me, I think that's the only game that really does four way. Uh, Galaga is a game that's only two way. So no matter what, it's only left and right. But Pac-Man is the one that people mostly get upset about because they play it, they're going right and they go left and it didn't register and it's still going right. That's because they didn't let go of the joystick right. Technically again, if you're going to 130, as you can see, like right now, I'm going up and it, it didn't move. So you have to release that button. That's why an eight-way joystick does not play well with four-way joystick games, most commonly Pac-Man. Um, that's the one biggest thing as far as the controls on this. The joysticks, remember there's two different ones, four-way and eight-way. I could show you how to change from a four-way to an eight-way. It's a quick kind of clip-on. Some of them you do have to screw and unscrew, but you know, sometimes you might if you don't do it right, you might mess it up. So keep that in mind, especially when you're playing Pac-Man. I do these eight-way joysticks. 
because in all honesty most of the games are eight ways but again some people aren't really a fan of how it registers for me i could play pac-man fine it's somewhere you just gotta you know after a time after a few after a few times of playing the game you'll be able to say okay you know what i got it now and all that but normally again pac-man is a four-way joystick this joystick is an eight-way configuration joystick again it's literally a plate that you could flip uh that's the number one thing about the joysticks that people notice is, is it vic you know playing pac-man it's it's not great yes you have to change it from an eight-way to a four-way um as far as the buttons buttons click you know these are like the dome shapes so they do have the top buttons on like a street fighter game has the groove in it the the finger in them which some people like that you have to get a standard button led buttons you can either do the regular buttons or the chrome kit i usually like the chrome kit this one specifically is without the chrome kit um buttons to me are buttons they click uh you know whether you want if you do want the the indent though you do have to get a regular style arcade button which does not come in leds you won't get an led regular standard groove kind of button um the other thing that a lot of people suggest to me and i could do it as you can see i do have the buttons the stickers on the buttons are inside the buttons, such as the player button and the coin button. Some people get upset because, you know, for example, Super Nintendo, it's A, B, X, Y, L, R. And, you know, they do suggest to me, hey Vic, can you put the button, you know, the what, what button is A, what button is B? But in all honesty, there's so many systems. That one button, button one is gonna say like five different letters. So I'm kind of up in the air on doing that. It is kind of a tedious thing because you do have to open up each button put the little sticker in, not to mention these are paper. So, you know, if you do spin the button, the paper will spin with it. So all of a sudden, after heavy usage, even my, my face keys here, the hot key and all that, the save button, it spins, the word spins. So some people get upset, but unless you put an actual physical sticker on the button, you can't do anything. Other people do put on the artwork, on the control panel artwork, they do put like the lettering there which you could do but you have to get you have to get the control panel sticker so now you're into the vinyl artwork of it now um other than that that's really it for control wise again these are set up for eight-way joysticks for you to enjoy pac-man you need a four-way joystick you could still enjoy pac-man on an eight-way it's just you have to let go of the joystick and then go into the next button so if you're holding right and you want to go up you gotta let go of right and then go up you have to let go of the button the button in reality, as far as the computer, it still thinks you're holding right because, you know, some people go diagonal with it. So that's the only real thing as far as the controllers. Again, we're going to make more videos in regards to this. I'm kind of just breezing through this because I got time real quick. But the only last thing that some people notice about these arcades is the screen resolution. Screen resolution is, you know, some people understand it, some people don't. Um, back in the day, especially with like the arcades and the end, you know, the Super Nintendo, you know, it was a four by three resolution. What does that mean? It was basically like a four by three, so it's almost an even square. On an HD TV, on a 1080p TV, if you do a four by three, and I'm gonna show it on the screen right now what the difference looks like, basically you're gonna get the sidebars. So there's three different ways you could set this up. You could set this up to the, the video games, the game's output is always four by three, no matter what, it's always four by three, which means you're always gonna see the sidebars. The other option is to stretch the screen, which is 16 by nine. Basically, you're going to take that 4x3 and you're going to stretch the screen out to give it full resolution, meaning you're going to give it a full screen setup. Some people like it, some people don't. Why won't you like a 16x9? Is because all the games now will look blurry. But you have to remember though, from a 4x3 to a 16x9, you're stretching that screen. So now, like for example, Super, Nintendo, uh, Super Mario, you know, Mario now might look a little bit more pixelated. Yes, that's what it does. You stretching the screen, you're gonna get pixels. A customer said to me, Vic, why is this game blurry? It's because it was stretching it from a four by three to a 16 by nine. The other option is to set the system up to do core. Basically core is whatever the game is set to, it's gonna load that resolution. So for example, right now, um, you know, let's, let's, let's flash, um, we'll flash Pac-Man on the screen. As you can see the sidebars, Pac-Man was set, let's say, by four by three. Now let's flash uh, Street Fighter. Street Fighter, as you can see right here, it's a little bit, it's a little bit there. You still see a little bit of the sideboards, but it's a little bit bigger than a four by three. And lastly, I'm gonna show you a Street Fighter with a 16 by nine. As you can see with the 16 by nine, the Street Fighter, it's, it's, it's stretched. You have a full screen game. 
to me, I always like my game 16 by 9. You have a 19 inch TV, you might as well utilize the entire thing. Uh, real quick, we're gonna, we're gonna show you like, for example, Game Boy. Game Boy, if you don't touch the configurations, Game Boy is set to 4x3, you see a lot of the sidebars. Try to remember that Game Boy was in your hand, it was a tiny square. Now we're gonna set it to 16 by 9. 16 by 9 now, you can see it's a big screen. It stretched it, it stretched the game out entirely. So keep that in mind. You let me know if you want me to keep it as core, meaning the system will know what game was set to what and basically your resolutions will go in and out. If you want me to set it to 16 by 9, which I always do, meaning every game will be stretched to 16 by 9, I could do that. Or if you want me to set it to 4 by 3, I could do that. Me personally, I set up my games for 16 by 9. It's kind of pointless when you have a 19 inch screen and you know, to me a 19 inch screen is small, but it's a bar top arcade, it's a small arcade. So I think that it should be stretched. If you want me to change it, you let me know. But that's really it. That's the most common things that people don't really understand. The cabinet, the controller, the bezel, and then finally really the screen resolution. Again, this is gonna conclude another video with Game Case Arcades. We're gonna make more as people you know, give me suggestions, but I'm just making this again because I have customers that say, hey Vic, I think there's something wrong with this, and in reality it is not. But again, any little question, any concern, if you guys need help, feel free to message me. I do help a lot. I had a guy that messaged me, uh, emailed me, and um, he said to me, hey Vic, I can't get a track mode off. I help people, that's what we do. Somebody messaged me about their arcade legends thing, I helped to guide them with that. So if you do need help, don't, free, don't be afraid to message me, I'm here to help. Guys, I'll see you on the next one.